Okay, thanks very much uh, for coming, everybody. Uh, my name is Tom Court. I work for a company called Alert Logic. Um, if you haven't heard of us, uh, we're a managed security company providing network security as a service. Uh, idea being, if you don't have the expertise to do um, the network monitoring and network security in-house, uh, you can pay a monthly fee and have it as a service and have world-renowned experts looking at your network traffic 24 hours a day. Um, purely passively, we, we don't do anything to block attacks, but we'll immediately inform uh, your, your internal IT guys that something bad is, is happening on your network. So I've been with Alert Logic for only two months. Before that, I was with GCHQ for uh, nine years, doing lots of things that I'm not allowed to talk about. Um, but I'm going to talk to you today about um, all the things, all the, all the different classes of people out there that are trying to steal all the data that Richard's just been talking about. Um, so you've decided what you want to protect. You probably want to know who's going after it uh, so that you can, you can prepare yourself and, and protect yourself accordingly. So brief summary about what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to talk about my particular area within Alert Logic. Um, it's not the within the 24-hour monitoring section, we take a step back and um, do some of the research that underpins the final security project, the product that we produce. Um, there'll be no, no sales pitch. That's, that's it from what, from what I'm going to talk about Alert Logic for. Um, I'm going to talk about the, the different types of threat actors out there. I'm going to show you a little bit of uh, the research that we've, that we've been doing based on what we see in the networks that we monitor uh, to give you an idea of the the threats that are out there and um, what you can expect. And then just a little nod to the future as to where, thing, where things are going and obviously an opportunity for, for questions. So within uh, Alert Logic, active intelligence is uh, where I work and that is a, a kind of fusion of people who've been in the industry for many years. So we've got people who've been in the, in the private sector, um, we've got people like me who've been working in government organisations, our director is uh, ex- Air Force, US Air Force intelligence. Um, we've got law enforcement people. And sitting right next to those, we've got data scientists. So you imagine the amount of data that there is out there. It's been alluded to many times today already. So stuff that's out there on the internet just waiting to be found um, in terms of the threats and the threat actors. But also the data that we collect internally um, the signatures that are firing when we're monitoring networks, we get a good visibility of the types of attacks that are, that are out there. So you've got data scientists and domain experts all putting their knowledge into, the, into one place to create security content. And this is the sort of things that we're, that we're looking for. So it's been mentioned before today, uh, data is a new currency when it comes to what criminals are, tr are trading in. So it helps to understand what is considered a valuable commodity in terms of the data that you, that you may or may not have. The obvious one is financial information, credit card numbers, that kind of thing. That's been around for a while. Uh, less obviously, more personal data. You're seeing an increase in uh, private healthcare companies getting breached recently because medical records are starting to, to gain value in these black markets in these, on, the, on the dark internet. So monitoring the trends in what is gaining value as far as what the criminals are trying to sell, give you a good idea as to whether your company is going to become a target for, for a sustained attack. So we're monitoring the underground economy. We're monitoring active campaigns. We run honey, honey nets on the internet. So we purposefully create um, mock-ups of servers and network environments that look juicy for attackers to, to gain access to but they're in isolated environments. So when they do attack, we get to see all the, all the things that the attackers have done to try and get onto our network. When they succeed, we get to see what kind of malware they're gonna put down. And we let the malware run, because it's in an isolated environment. Once the malware runs, we get to see what that malware does, what it tries to do to the file system, what it does to the, how it, who it talks to. Does it wait for a period of time? What does it look for in terms of, is it trying to hide from antivirus products, that kind of thing? So we can start to build up a picture of the, the attackers out there, their infrastructure, where they're launching their attacks from, what they're throwing, and then what, what their software, what their malware is doing when it's on your network. So we can then build signatures, uh, 
build ways of detecting this stuff. So we can, we can detect attackers trying to get into your network. If they do get in, we can detect them trying to beacon back out to their, to their controllers. And if they can do that, we can, we can create signatures to, to spot them trying to exfiltrate data out of your network. So multiple levels where we can potentially stop uh, you becoming the next headline in terms of big data breach. External engagement, as I mentioned, we've got um, people working for us who have got good links with law enforcement, ex-law enforcement employees. Uh, so if we find anything that is actionable in terms of law enforcement, um, we, can, we can involve them. So onto the three types. You've probably heard of uh, at least one of those. Probably most, most people have at least heard of all three types of threat actor. For those who can't see the slides, Cyber criminals, that's probably a catch-all term for all of them, but there's a specific sort of cyber criminal that I've got in mind for them. Um, we'll talk about them first. Um, but after that, we'll talk about the hacktivist. So the amalgamation of a hacker and an activist becomes a hacktivist. And you get people like the anonymous group, LulzSec, Lizard Squad, all these people who, who end up on the news um, and start tweeting, tweeting lots of rubbish. And then you've got the APT, the Advanced Persistent Threat. Um, you, could, you can classify those as the more serious types, the harder to defend against, um, but also a much rarer class of attacker that most people will never have to worry about. So, criminal actors. I'm defining these as the people who don't really care who they get. They just want to spread their malware in the hope that they would land on someone interested. So it's really indiscriminate, scattergun approach. They're going after the low-hanging fruit of the, of the internet users, people who don't apply security updates, people who don't, or people who don't have uh, good security practices, people who put their credentials on GitHub or the like. And they've really got two ways in. As far as, well, three, three actually. One's not on this slide. So from a server side, if you've got server infrastructure, you're most likely to come under attack from this by just attackers scanning swathes of IP addresses on the internet in the hope that they find something with an open port and they just launch a dictionary attack against it. So they just try many different combinations of usernames and passwords in the hope that you haven't changed the default or that you've used a weak password. And occasionally they'll get in and then they'll be able to use that that server, either to steal the data that's on it or to use it as an infrastructure platform to launch further attacks. But from an end user's point of view, there are kind of two ways in to your computer to steal your credit card data, to steal your personal data. And that is one by spam. So they'll send you emails of varying uh, quality. It always amazes me why they don't spell check their emails before they, before they send them. Um, but you've all, everyone's seen them. Please send me money or please click on this link. Your classic one is, we think your bank details have been compromised. Please log into this website to check. So they give you a link that looks like it's for HSBC, but it's, uh, if, you, if you look in the little status bar at the bottom, you'll notice that it's not. It's, it's somewhere else. So maybe they're just going to get you to volunteer your credentials uh, to, your, to your banking or to, to whatever. Or maybe they'll be a little bit more clever, they might have gone on to the internet, they might have found somewhere on the internet an exploit toolkit, you might have heard that word before. That's, Metasploit would be a good example of a, of a very simple exploit toolkit, one that you can just go and download off the internet, stick on a web server, entice people to visit it, and then when you, when, when you visit it, it'll throw some JavaScript back at you and try and work out what you're running, so it'll, it'll send back to the attacker this guy is running Chrome, or this guy's running Internet Explorer, um, he's running Windows XP, he, it might enumerate some of the antivirus capabilities. And then this exploit toolkit, or this exploit kit, will run through all the exploits that it has in its database and pick one that it thinks will work against that target and throw that back at you. It usually does this by adding add injection. If you've got no other way of getting onto a, onto a box, if no one's clicking on the emails that you're sending them, maybe you could just use a legitimate service like Google AdNet or any other advertising network. 
they're really good because they get, if, you, if you're going to buy advertising space on Google, you send Google the advert that you're going to send, and you also send um, some guidance as to what kind of person you want to see that advert. So based on whatever they're doing on the internet, Google will decide to send your advert rather than someone else's. So that gives you a, a way to, to send your code to a poor innocent victim via a legitimate service like Google. And a popular way to do this is to use Flash. Flash is always in technology press for having lots of vulnerabilities. They're always patching it. They're always finding more. And it's one of those pieces of software that, unless you're, you're IT savvy, you probably don't know what it is. Or you, it's just yet another thing that asks for updates every now and then, and you don't want to restart your computer or your browser because you've got a million tabs open that you don't want to close. So you say, oh, I'll do it later. I'll do it later. And you put your computer to sleep. It, you, you open it up again. It's still nagging you. And you never get around to installing that Flash update. But this Google advert that's just been sent to you is, it might be an advert, but it'll also be a Flash video or just a one by one pixel with a, with a Flash video in it. So you're not going to see it, but it will include an exploit for that vulnerability that Flash patched months ago, but you haven't got around to installing the updates. Or maybe you're on a company network and you're not in control of the updates. The company's decided that you, that the version of Flash they've got, works fine for all their, their applications. If we update it, that might break something, and that's going to cause the IT department some work. So maybe we, we, we don't want to do that yet. We'll do a phased rollout of that at another point in time. For now, we're fine. Maybe not, because in malvertising, you can see on this diagram here, that's how it works. The advert comes down. It's that bit of JavaScript that enumerates all the things on your machine, finds you running an outdated version of Flash, sends you a Flash video, it runs without asking you, and boom, you're exploited. And then this is what uh, Brian Krebs, who's a technology journalist in the UK, in the US, called the hack value of a PC. So as Richard mentioned, as soon as your computer is compromised in any way, you no longer own it. The cyber criminal can use it for whatever they like. These are just a few examples, and we can go around a few of them. So as well as stealing your data, your financial data, your account details for, uh, I don't know, your NHS account or, or your tax records, it can be used as a platform to launch other attacks. So you could be unwillingly a volunteer in a, in a DDoS network. So the next time someone's website gets taken offline, your computer might have been involved in that because it's now under the control of, of somebody else. The, the dark web has, has come up a few times today. There's also another phrase, the deep web. Has anyone heard of either one of those terms? Lots of people, yeah. I'm not going to ask you, but could anyone confidently tell me the difference between the deep web and the dark web? Ah. So the deep web might not necessarily be bad. The deep web's just stuff that's quite difficult to find. It's not designed to be found on the internet, so it's not going to come up in any standard uh, Google search you do. Jason might be able to find it with his Google foo that he's got going on there. Um, but, you know, it's, it's usually just an IP address. You need to know where to look to find it. A lot of it is bad, but it doesn't necessarily need to be. The dark web is something different. The dark web tends to be what people refer to the most, and that's where all the nefarious stuff happens. You have to use specialized software to, to view any of it. The deep web, you can point your web browser at it. You can see it as long as you know where to look. The dark web, you need to be running something like Tor, the onion router, that stands for, um, to get onto it. And that's a scenario where you as a user of the dark web don't want to be identified, want to remain anonymous, and those serving you the content also want to remain anonymous. So that's where all these um, marketplaces like Silk Road, um, Alpha Bay, to name just two of them, uh, operate where they'll sell you anything and everything. You still have to get it posted somewhere, though, if it's a physical good. So I don't quite know how you trust them to, to do that. But anyway, it's not just drugs and weapons you can buy on there. You can buy credit card details, account details. This is the sort of place where your personal data gains value. So your, even your Netflix account, there are plenty of people willing to pay far less 
else than Netflix are going to charge you a month for someone else's login, login credentials to view it. So you can go on there, and for a few, few dollars, a few Bitcoin, a few fractions of a Bitcoin, you, could, uh, you can buy what you want. And then you've got ransomware, which is an emerging... It's, it's been around for a while, but it's, it's generating a lot of traction, a lot of press at the moment. It's a current favourite in the cyber, cyber crime arsenal. So this is where, instead of just stealing all your, all your uh, credentials and selling them on the, on the dark web, it will go around your My Documents folder, it will do a search on your computer for anything that's, that looks like a document or an image or anything that has value for you, and it would in, just encrypt it and just leave it on your disk, and it will pop up a box like that that says, your files have been encrypted, you can't access them anymore unless you pay us loads of money. And for some people, if that was their entire photo collection for, since the beginning of digital cameras, people might think it's probably worth paying the 100 euros that that one particular one is, is asking for. It's your choice whether you decide to pay that ransom, but it's also the cyber criminal's choice as to whether to honour his side of the deal when you pay. So just because you've given him the 100 euros, the nature of the fact that he's a criminal suggests you shouldn't probably trust him to, uh, to give you the key to unlock your data. Some of them amazingly do, but uh, don't trust it. Lots of them these days come with manuals as to how to generate bitcoins or how to buy bitcoins so you can pay uh, and the attacker can receive that payment anonymously. So how do you stay safe from all of this? And this is illustrating why I'm not a salesman, because I do not recommend antivirus products for this. Things that Jason were, taught, were showing us earlier, attacks you can download off the internet. Antivirus products will catch them in their native form. If you just download them and run them, fine. I've done it myself, an afternoon of work, changing variable names, change the script a little bit. If you know what you're doing, half an hour, well, an hour's work maybe, and you can modify those scripts so that none of those antivirus products and all the others, I'm not singling those out, just got lazy with my Google search, um, they wouldn't detect it. And these are patched vulnerabilities. These are vulnerabilities that were patched years ago. It's so easy to write them in a slightly different way that their engine won't catch it. I mentioned at the start that these cyber criminals go after the low-hanging fruit. They don't care who they're after. So they, just want, they know that there are enough people around running outdated software that they can throw this stuff indiscriminately and they'll get enough people biting to make a living from it. So the best thing that you and your business can do to stay safe against the cyber criminals is just to install Windows Update and all the other updates that pop up. And it sounds obvious, but I've got two examples involving my father and my wife where this apparently isn't, isn't obvious. When I met my wife, I went, to, went around to her house for the first time and was using her laptop, and there was a bubble that popped up, and it was the Windows Update thing. It said, you have 300 updates to install. I said, well, why haven't you installed these? And she said, well, I've heard a lot about uh, people hacking, my com hacking computers these days. So when a box popped up that said, please install all this stuff, I got scared and thought it was, I was being hacked, so I didn't do it. I just left it there. So even people who think that they've got a gist of security might, be, might need the old prompter to just install Windows Update and not become one of that tiny fraction percentage of people um, that are vulnerable to these things. So the hacktivist. That's a familiar... Familiar photo for anyone who, who uses Twitter. And for a while, this was one of the UK's most famous exports. Uh, four UK arrests came out of this. So hacktivists, people who are not hacking for money, or not uh, overtly anyway, they're hacking to make a, some kind of point, whether it be political or um, any other kind of point. They're just looking to cause this disruption, damage, and get recognition for it. LulzSec, there's a couple of claimed activities there. Sony, CIA website, News Corp, the US Senate. Disrupting, defacing websites, hacking Twitter accounts, that kind of thing. And you think, that's small fare, really. So what if my Twitter account gets hacked? Well, I guess it depends on whose Twitter account it is. 
The person who runs the Associated Press website obviously didn't have a very secure password. Because when this happened and someone guessed the password correctly, just put out a tweet saying there were some explosions in the White House. Look at the instant reaction that happened for a few seconds afterwards while people worked out whether this was a joke or not. If you were in the right place at the right time, and I'm sure people were, you could have made a lot of money on that. More seriously, more, and more recently actually, just in April this year, French TV channel for a few hours got completely taken offline, 11 channels. Again, probably a, the result of weak, weak credentials, no one really knows. Their website was defaced, their Facebook page was defaced, but interestingly, they did something else. They took their email server offline as well so that the um, incident response people couldn't coordinate. Must have caused chaos. So in terms of mitigating against that password management, these people are not doing anything clever. They're guessing passwords. They might be using patch vulnerabilities. Very few of them, if any of them, get onto networks for that kind of activity using zero days. They can't afford them. If you want to buy them on the black market, they're thousands and thousands of pounds. These guys can. Advanced persistent threat. Different model altogether. These people, they know exactly who they're after, and they know exactly what they want to steal. They're not just going after the low-hanging fruit on the off chance they might stumble across some personal data that they could sell on the internet. They come in lots of different flavors. They could be nation states. I know some people would regard my previous employer as an APT, but it doesn't have to be. It could be um, anyone who's got advanced capabilities who are prepared to put the effort in to steal something specific. They'll often be the ones using the zero days. These are the ones that are hardest to defend against because you don't know what the attack's gonna look like in advance. So they'll use some un previously unknown hole in your software or your security practices. They'll have created some bespoke malware to do exactly the job that they want to be done. So it won't just be some generic thing that they've found lying around. And they'll have networks in place to extract the data uh, in a covert manner. A good non-nation state example of this is something that Richard talked about earlier. Uh, the data breach on Target last year. 70 million customers were, uh, were affected by this. The people that did it knew exactly what they were after. They, they wanted to get onto the point of sale systems, the tills, and clone the credit cards as they were being swiped. And this is how they did it. It wasn't obvious at all. They didn't go straight for Target's network because tar Target's network was a hard target. They found that a third party contractor Someone who was contracted to do refrigeration for Target had been given login credentials to the billing system for Target, for whatever reason. And so the theory goes that this attack happened by the attacker going in, get, targeting the uh, refrigeration contractor with some spam emails. And at some point, obviously that worked because the malware got installed on the contractor who had access to the billing data of Target. And that gave them a first foothold in the Target network. From there, they sat on the, on the portal that they were given access to and they scanned from there. They looked around to see where they could go from there. It took them weeks of bespoke malware being installed on every box that they found that they could get onto before they managed to migrate themselves into the part of the network that gave them access to the point of sale terminals. And then when they were there, they had bespoke malware that knew exactly what the, the point of sale software was running on the tills so that they could successfully exploit that software. They knew where, the, where in memory the credit card details were going to be stored when the card was swiped. So they could clinically go in and just grab that chunk of memory and exfiltrate it out to a load of servers in Russia. It looks really advanced. It certainly requires a lot of patience, and it requires a lot of hard work to maintain that kind of access for that long. But look at the initial infection vector. It was spam. The incredible thing is that Target had network monitoring in their network. A 
forget who was doing it, but they were doing a good job. They were flagging up that, yes, there was anomalies in the network. Something unusual was going on. And they were reporting this back to Target, to say, look, you should check out your network. We think that you've got malware on it. It looks, it looks bad. But those, those um, what do you call it? Those alerts would uh, go unnoticed, unheard. Whoever was getting them wasn't acting on them or wasn't acting fast enough because 70 million people's uh, personal data was affected from that. So the moral of the story is, if you've got network monitoring, if you're paying for network monitoring, make use of it. Don't just think that you're, that you're safe. Antivirus software is dangerous. It gives you that fuzzy feeling of security. It, th it makes you feel that you don't have to think about that anymore. Wrong. You've still got to think about it. You've still got to understand. Don't end up like the Sony boss flipping to a different, different bridge here. They came in the house, stole everything, burned down the house. They destroyed the servers, the computers, wiped them all clean of data, and took all the data. They had no playbook, as they say. They had no response plan for this kind of incident. Always assume that you're going to be the next breach. But also remember that it takes time for an attacker once in their network to find their way around, find what they're looking for, and extract the data to an external place. So even if you fail on the first security hurdle and the malware ends up on your network, you've still got time to do something about it before you end up like Target or Sony. So there are the three kinds. It's just going to end just to show you a few uh, things we found on our whilst monitoring networks. Relative threats, so Alert Logic provides um, security to both on-premise and in cloud infrastructure, so we can kind of give you some stats on different types of attack and how they affect different, different network configurations. You can see that Trojan activity, that is the sort of malware that's sitting on a host, far more common on an on-premise infrastructure. Makes sense, that's where all the end users are. Denial of service, recon, brute force, all much more common in the cloud infrastructure. That's where all the server-side web apps and things are going to hit. So you're obviously going to get more people doing denial of service against that kind of thing. That's the public-facing side of your business. This you probably can't see from the back, but industry verticals. So real estate on the left, the red says that 60% of our real retail estate customers, sorry, real estate customers, 60% uh, of the attacks that they experience are against their web applications. Again, that makes sense. They're, they're an industry that has a big public-facing web presence, lots of custom applications running. That's the sort of thing that they're seeing attacked. At the, end of the other end of the scale, in the mining, the financial institutions, the telecoms, transportation, those are industries that have a small public-facing footprint on the web, but they've got large server infrastructure dotted around the place. So the attacks that affect those kind of industries tend to be more along the lines of brute force password guessing attacks, um, general reconning to see what versions of software you've got running, whether you have patched for the heart bleed vulnerability, for example and just generally suspicious stuff that's going on. Straight from the honeypot that we were running, you can see the two most likely services to come victim to uh, some kind of password guessing brute force attack, SSH, obviously. Do you need your uh, SMB shares to be accessible on the internet? Those are obviously the two big ones, but there's plenty of other services there which you, you would see attached to the internet. Do you need your MySQL database to be uh, accessible directly from the internet? If so, you better have a strong password on it. These are the sort of usernames that you see uh, being, being attacked. Obviously, everyone wants to be root when they go onto the server, so root is by far and away the most uh, common username to be attacked. Given that, if you can disable root login from the internet or from anywhere really and require a named user to go in before elevating to root, much better idea. You can see it 
leaves 2% of dictionary attacks that are going to attack you. But then of the rest, you can see a lot of them you could have guessed as to the sorts of usernames they're going to try. Administrator, FTP user, um, admin, support, guest, all the usual ones. But there are some interesting ones as well. PLCM, SLP, SPLP, SPIP, I think that is, which you think that's an unusual one. It's a default username for a VoIP client that, or a VoIP uh, service that's running on a server. So be aware of what's running on your, on your servers and be aware that some of them might have uh, default usernames and passwords to log into them. Future threats. I'm going to apologize about this slide. This, I pulled this slide off uh, a few weeks ago. It's been recently discredited, but the point is still there. The slide claims, this research claim, that 75% of businesses still haven't patched for uh, Heartbleed, which I read it and thought that's ridiculous, but found more than one source that was claiming it, so okay. Since then, it's, it's come to bear that it's not 75% of people who are still vulnerable to Heartbleed. It's of all the people that were vulnerable to Heartbleed and patched it, didn't then change their certificates. So you might have patched the, the bug, because that was what all the hoo-ha was about. But if the attackers had got in before you patched it and stole your, your SSL certificate, or your, your key, if you haven't changed it, you're still vulnerable. That's what that's about. We need to think of a better way of doing it. Because getting everyone to patch at the same time before attackers get a chance to get onto your network is becoming more and more difficult. Attackers are getting faster. Vulnerabilities are coming thick and fast. And the skills shortage. As a cybersecurity professional, I both love and hate this slide. This slide means that I'm always going to be in, in work, but it also is a really bleak outlook for the rest of the industry. There are not enough people learning cybersecurity skills to protect all the cybersecurity businesses or all the businesses requiring cybersecurity in the world. But then to end on an uplifting note, why should there be a skills shortage? This was an experiment done by the One Laptop Per Child Foundation. They gave a bunch of kids in a third world company a bunch of, a bunch of these One Laptop Per Childs running Android. Didn't tell them how to use them, just gave them the box. Look at what happened. Within four minutes, they'd opened the box. They'd found the on-off switch. Within five days, they were using apps. They'd installed 47 of them. Within two weeks, they were singing songs. Don't know what that was about. But after five months, some of them had started to break Android. They decided that what it was doing wasn't what they wanted it to do. They wanted it to do more than they were being allowed to do. So they hacked it. And they were getting it to do things that it shouldn't. So into it. Inquisition, intuition is innate. We should be able to harness the human spirit for doing this kind of thing. Problem solving is what solving cybercrime is all about. So that's what I'd like to end on. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Um, we're running slightly behind. Are there any questions for Tom? Please. I'm a police officer. Sorry. I'm a police officer from the regional cybercrime unit. I'm interested in the fact that you sandbox things, you test things, you deal with customers and clients. From our perspective, one of the biggest challenges we face is encouraging people to report that these incidents have even taken place. Do you think there's an appetite out there for us to get engaged as law enforcement to try and catch the people at the other end? Is it a reputational thing that we're being told where people don't want their reputations damaged, which is why they're not encouraged to come to us? Or alternatively, is it because they don't trust that you've got the capacity to deal with this type of offence? Uh, well, I think there's, n there's a number of layers there. Reputation definitely is a, is a problem. No one wants to admit that they're the next Target or Sony. That's going to change because it's going to become law very soon that you have to. So that will be, will be out of the window. As far as uh, getting law enforcement to go after the people that did it, it's very difficult. You know, attribution is, 
is one of the hardest parts of this. You can you can you can sit on the network on the on the sort of gateway into a into a network, and you can see all the things coming in. You can see if you've got good logging, you can see how the attack took place, what they used to get onto the network, what they installed. You can use all the honeypot data to work out what it was going to do. But the IP address that sent all that nasty stuff is probably got nothing to do in the big picture with the, the people that are trying to attack you. It's probably just a compromised machine from another hack that they did, or they might be using anonymization software like Tor. So it's, engaging in law enforcement would be good, and sometimes you do get lucky, and you, you, they make, the cyber criminals will make a mistake, and you'll be able to engage law enforcement and send them around to, to take down the server, if it's within your ju juris jurisdiction. But um, really, it's the onus on the, the company to accept that these bad guys are out there, and 99% of them probably will never get caught. Um, it's up to the companies themselves to be, to be security aware and to, to report what, what does happen so that the rest of the world can benefit from that. I think that's the, that's the message to which we're trying to, to give in, in alert logic. We protect thousands of customers, and everyone benefits from something bad happening to one person. Because as soon as it happens bad to one person, we then know what to look for to protect everybody else. So if, customer, if companies start volunteering the fact that they've been breached and give some indication of how, that's got to benefit everybody. Does that answer your question, Ish? That's great.